This is a free podcast from the BBC. For more information, you can go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio2. And for those listeners who missed the pre-Eurovision show, says Topsy, uh, making your mind up, it went a bit like this. Six acts competed, two judges voted and kicked out three acts. Terry Wogan then chose one of the rejected acts as his wild card, and the reject act went on to win the show. Next year, why not Why not cut the chase, cut the middleman, forget the judges, forget the public vote? Terry should forget all that running around b- between the stage and the chair, just sit down, watch everyone sing, and then pick the winner. He's bound to be right. And no, if you leave me on my own, I'll probably pick about two or three winners. And save a lot of shouting at the telly. Oh, don't tell me you were shouting at the telly. As if anything, Eurovision... Your decision was showing would cause you to shout. I watched Eurovision You Decide What Dream Will Do Factor on Saturday night, says Katie Boyle, but I have to say it was a pale imitation of making your mind up. I was expecting something novel when it came to the declaration of the winning song. What do we get? One single winner, that's what. Call that an improvement. And now I've heard the winning song several times, not once does the lyric mention Binga Banga Bong or Pringa Pranga Prong. You realise that if it finishes Royaume-Uni nul point again, we know where to come looking, as you pick this chap out as your wild card. Card, Katie. I think she should still be doing it. I've just cottoned on. Have you, Michael? Reverend Michael Bentley has just cottoned on. He's still practising Bach's B minor mass with the Bracknell Choral Society. Nice to hear your pale voice this morning. Welcome back. Like me, you seldom have holidays. Yeah, well, I... I'd like to get a chance to catch up on the old DIY. Uh, at last you're back, says Rose. I've taken a day off in celebration. Driving people from their workplace, that's what I'm doing. I was listening to that young twig, Russell Davis. There isn't a mark on him, you know. Picture in the attic on the light programme yesterday evening. And in between spinning platters. Ah, God, I used to spin platters. Yeah. By Rex Harrison and Ted Lewis. It took me back 30 years when he played There's a Lighthouse uh, Shines Beyond the Bay by Conrad Veidt. Yes, indeed. Oh, I'd like to know about stargazing. As it's, I'd like to be known, yes? Oh, cheerful less is at the door. Stargazing. Oh, it was a grand song. One day we will play it again for you and you will stand to attention. Look, uh, Norman... Oh, Norman of Newport and South Wales, isn't it? I hope you enjoyed your two weeks away and rested well. Well, myself and Hells, on the other hand, have been slaving away a whole new set of websites. There's a brand new www.togscalendar, one word, dot org, with a different shopping experience. There's a new shopping cart website. It's all for children in need. And a fun and games page, a prize crossword, and oh, and there's an Easter sale. Classic Pudsy and a collectible egg cup of your choice, the polo shirt. It's, I'll tell you more details as we go through the week, of course, but it sounds like a very exciting website. If you want to help children in need, join the dogs. Now, it's good to get a feedback on the auction for things that money can't buy because people give us a great deal of money to help children in need. And uh, on Tuesday, the 13th of November, Matt Cunningham uh, gave us £15,000 for a trip to London, a pampering at the Avita Spa, an afternoon tea with Michael Ball in his dressing room at Shaftesbury Theatre, and seats at the hit musical Hairspray. They didn't know about Michael Ball's manners at the time, and the little pinky finger sticking out when he drinks the tea. But Matt had a trip all, all arranged, actually, for his family. Janie and Anna gave us a ton of money for it, and apparently, I hear, they tell me, we had a fantastic time in London the morning at the spa, was relaxing, Excitement in the afternoon, perfect combination. Michael Ball was really very nice and made us feel very welcome. He's a decent fella. I couldn't believe he spent so much time with us. And many thanks to Andrew and Tim at the theatre, who were great. The show deserved to be the hit it is. Of course it does. Hairspray. Terrific. It's good to hear that you had a wonderful time. Of course, we can never repay the £15,000, but at least we made it worth your while. And don't forget, Michael Ball starts his new Sunday Radio 2 show on Sunday the 6th of April. It is in my diary. You missed the fella. You see, I missed a bit while I was away. Parnsley Chop says, you missed the fellow who set his pants on fire on his bike. No, that was seems to me more staggering than the earthquake. I was back in time for the earthquake. Mm, spooky. Woke up on the bed shaking. 
Since the wife had already paid the milkman, I knew it couldn't be him again. And spontaneously combusting cyclists and earthquakes. That's what we're looking for. More of that. I tuned in this morning, says Paige, uh, for a welcome dose of wonderful wit, sharp and interesting conversation, great music and singing news readers. Uh, I see you're back still. Mustn't grumble. Reading the news of the pig farmers marching on Whitehall. I fell off me chair, says Barnsley Chump. Well, I saw that among them will be a nine-year-old veteran protester called Winnie, who just happens to be a pig. Uh, call me cynical. I'm not entirely convinced that having a pig warning us about a shortage of sausages is the best way to go on this one. Well, look, Barnsley, I think perhaps you're, you're digging too deeply into the old prospect, but we, our sympathies are with, I think, the pig producers and the pig farmers. Uh, good morning and, and welcome home. Well, who said I'd been away, Peter Keane of Walsall? I settled down last evening to watch the final of University Challenge. Yes, me too. Didn't answer a single question. Expecting a nail-biting edge of the seat contest, and I wasn't disappointed. Cracking show. Until, that is, the triumphant team were asked to step up and collect the trophy, presented so graciously by Dame Joan Bakewell, only to be presented with a piece of corrugated iron off the BBC bike shed. Yes, when they, when they give awards within the BBC, they give slates off the old roof. <laughs> and expect people to be delighted. Having listened to the BBC or the Togs bemoaning the lack of prizes on your show, I think that this opens a whole new range of opportunities for you to satisfy their cravings. Well, yes, we're always looking for the opportunity to satisfy the listeners' cravings. We could see prizes on offer, such as John Marsh's disused shaving brush, King Dedicote's comb, Lynn Bowles' old Clark's pies wrapper, and even your unused airline tickets to Denmark. <laughs> while you were away, says Elsie, Elsie fits ready. Why, while you were away, I searched for something suitable to listen to. Oh, I know, there's, there's, divil, there's divil and all on, is there? There's nothing on the telly, and as for the radio... Well, I read in the Daily Mail that people are up in arms. They want more instrumental music. That's what live music, that's what we want. <laughs> and I found a program where the presenter spoke slowly, using simple words, constantly had trouble finishing his sentences, sounded confused by straightforward ideas, and kept repeating himself as if trying to reassure himself he hadn't quite lost his faculties. Ah, I thought, this is the nice BBC's new programme for people who are too old and bewildered even to cope with Wogan. And I listened happily for two weeks. Mr Moyles, I think he said his name was. His carer sounded quite nice too. I kept hoping he'd play Gilly Gilly Orson Pfeffer cuts in Ellen Bogan by the sea, but he played lots of what I think they call wicked music, which at least was nice and loud, so I could hear it. Super! Wow! Fantastic! Way to go! Yes, indeed, Bill Hollowell. Who's woken him up? We've finally cracked the Eurovision. Ah, oh, yes. Tuned in just in time to hear that wonderful upbeat one from Katrina on Saturday night. That'll show Johnny Farno he's still got it. Produced a surefire winner to guarantee the victor's laurels for good old Blighty. More power to yes, yes. I, you've missed the point, Bill. That was just... Oh, I time not bothering explaining to you. St. Trivial's finishing school for girls, the great Sabi desert in Thirsk. Megan, I'm absolutely disgusted by the abuse that's been heaped upon you yesterday morning. It's disgraceful. People have no respect for the elderly. I'm going to buck the trend. I missed you. I missed your witty banter, your smooth, honeyed tones. I'm pleased you're back. Now, I need to take my medication, but I can't reach you because I can't get me out of this nice little jacket with the arms tied at the back. Yeah, well, how do you think I feel, Megan? It's not easy to work this complicated equipment in a straight jacket. And I was sat sitting. Were you indeed, Lollipop? You know how to get round me. For your wonderful voice to drift across the airwaves, you know I can read this kind of letter forever. When I started thinking, no, lollipop, big mistake. Living on Earth is expensive, but it does include a free trip around the sun every year. If we are what we eat, then I'm easy, fast and cheap. <laughs> I'm in shape. Round as a shape. So, Robin Goodfellow, 49 three quarters, did you enjoy your two weeks in Clacton? You look refreshed. Well, according to Sarah Kendi, I paid as a ghost. I was wondering if you stayed at the same boarding house as we did a few years back. Oh, we've already had a boarding house that ran out of custard. Mrs. Mack always served breakfast with a liberal sprinkling of cigarette ash from her ever-present woodbine. Ah, oh, the woodbines, the wild woodbines. 
Unfortunately, Mr. Mac still had the, the shakes, I'm afraid, so ordering the soup was always a hazardous affair, and if anyone thinks I made this up, they couldn't be more wrong. I don't know the bone. Oh, Robin, I've stayed in a few strange places myself when I was a boy. <laughs> I've a filling. He's still flossing in Darlington. I had an 8.30 appointment with my dentist yesterday, Radio 2, blaring out in the waiting room, even in the room where I was having the filling. You were on as I lay flat on the chair. Two injections were required, followed by 20 minutes of purgatory. The drill drowned you out for a while, which was some comfort. The price of a filling in a clean, 69 quid. I don't know which was the most painful, the treatment, the cost of the treatment. I happened to listen to you. <laughs> Nobody said that life was going to be easy, Ivor. And uh, Owen Money, who is in the know, you know, well, he's in Sir Roger Moore's office, and her chuffer Dandridge, uh, blow the lid about him being the third persuader, hoping for a mention in my superior's book. Uh, I would suggest he arrange a very swift return, that chuffer, of the fiver that he borrowed in 1971 to buy himself a bit of bread and drip from the canteen. He was never seen on the set after that, though they did discover he spun the same yarn to most of the cast and crew and accrued a number of fivers. Tell him not to smoke that cigarette Tony Curtis gave him. It's a lovely morning. Yeah, down here in the southern softy land. I hope the sun may shine on you. A frosty, of course, but that's the time of the year that's in it. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, just before the end of the show, we had a, a tale of a man who went into B&Q and was asked if he wanted decking. And he struck out immediately, uh, rather than get a box in the ear. And he said, you just want to watch out. And um, David Lloyd said, and I was wandering aimlessly in John Lewis's, and a nice girl asked me if I wanted bedding. And the aftermath was that the manager said, I'll have to find another department store. This is just a variation on the old joke. We can never go to that restaurant again. Well, according to one news report, Jan of Darren keeps me abreast, along with listening to Sarah and her uh, news reports and all that's happening in showbiz and all the premieres to which none of us are ever invited anymore, being old geezers and gals. Well, according to one news report, cardigans are the must-wear for spring. Well, yes, Sarah made that clear. And uh, I understand the much-beloved uh, has a nice uh, number in, in purple... I can't wait to see it. Not only that, I noticed on one fashion page, says Jam, that beige and taupe are the new colours for spring. You see, what goes around comes around. If you hang around long enough, for instance, in the case of Charlie Nove, he'd been hanging around for years, and here he is, right here on the cutting edge, in a zip-up cardigan. Well done to the newsreader on good old Radio 4 yesterday evening, says Tansy. Tansy White Pits. By adding 17p on the price of bacon, the pig on the street has a future. Not a very long one, mind you. So, says Baz of Wilts, who's at last have been managed to write a letter to us. So, short people will live longer than tall people. Good news for me. Not such good news for mixed herbs. <laughs> you have to know these people. Yeah, well, they're all part of a little club, you know. And, um, welcome back, Derry. And the, uh, uh, thank you. I haven't had that many welcome backs. I've had dogs abuse in the main. I didn't see you on the red carpet at the Oscars. <laughs> I wish I was in a position to see the American coverage of the Oscars, and you missed it, let me tell you. There was a lot of what could only be described as Botox about. Who are all those people? And at the Brits, who are all those people? And you even missed Brucey's 80th birthday bash. Oh, I wasn't in the country, but uh, I don't think I was asked anyway. Who were all those people? However, there was a bloke who looked a bit like you on Eurovision, your decision. Perhaps not. He wasn't wearing moleskin trousers. Everything went off without a hitch. Really? <laughs> that wasn't my experience. Oh, here's something for an old tog that might have read a book once. Ah, well, yes, we do like Anver, Anver Everett Blowing Bubbles is writing in. Uh, René Descartes was drinking heavily in a bar. And the barman thought it was probably time he wended his weary way home and said, René, a last drink for the road, perhaps? Uh, I think not, replied René, upon which he disappeared. Anyway, I'm outraged on your behalf. Thank God somebody's outraged in that West. Cold pies. Yes, we got cold pies yesterday. It's supposed to be National Pie Week. And they send him in and you've got to cook them. For goodness sake. You know, between 7.30 and 9.30, we 
eat anything, really. <laughs> and, but not a cold pie. How dare those frivolous fools sully your proud palate with cold pies. They've got some nerve. Even Sweeney Todd served them hot. I love the idea of people uh, going along to Sweeney Todd <laughs> and leaving after about ten minutes when they realised it was a musical. <laughs> welcome back. Ah, Lucy Crippen, another welcome back. I don't believe it, Barrowlands. Huh? That's two of them. <laughs> the old Scottish joke. It's so good to hear your dulcet tones again on the light programme, Monday to Saturday, 7 to 9. Far be it for me to grudge you a break from your honest toil, loose equipment of snowy Grand Town on Spey. But do you have any idea how time-consuming it is for me, each time you return, to remind the present Mr. Equipment of the house rule? Terry talks, you don't and to retrain him not to park his Land Rover outside the bathroom window where it interferes with reception on the shower radio. <laughs> all, all human life is here. Next time you fancy a wee break, how about doing away with the programme sitters and airing the best of Wogan? It would be a brief show. And Barnsley, ah, there you are again. I need answers to questions, and your lot seem to be the biggest bunch of know-alls outside of Radio 4. Firstly, given the ever-depleting levels of petroleum and the possible implications for a new world order, should I be devoting my time to discovering clean, reusable energy resources, or shall I just have another biscuit? And secondly, barely a week after the great earthquake of 2008, my kitchen clock is running seven hours slow. Did the quake fracture local time, sending my kitchen back in time by seven hours? Or do I just need to change the battery? I, Barnsley, I think you've probably slipped through a hole in the time-space continuum. And Captain Pete, from In Dire Need in Derbyshire... <coughs> we did have a story yesterday, yes, about uh, the man who went into B&Q and was asked if he wanted decking and got his retaliation in first. And uh, then again, somebody wrote uh, this morning about... Having in John Lewis's asked if he wanted betting by an overeager female sales assistant, and I have a coincidental misfortune uh, of meeting the self same sales assistant when she worked in Smith's, the news agents. Really, Captain Pete. I approached her workstation and asked if she kept stationery. She said, Only until the last few minutes, and then I go wild. Hugh Bounder says, Morning, old bean. Morning, Hugh. I couldn't help noticing the Telegraph as a hard-hitting journalist with the name of Laura Clout. Now, I wasn't born yesterday. This has got to be one of your correspondents or someone from Private Eye. Own up, for goodness sake. Yeah, there's more going on than you know about. Your other listener referred to the surprise. Yes, indeed, at seeing the winners of University Challenge coming out and getting what looked like a load of old scrap. But my shock came the moment their old conquering captain stepped out, says Uma, Uma Head. Talk about feet of clay. His trousers belong to a 1950s American car salesman. Let's have no talk of trousers. There was a widespread rejoicing in Bungie, says Saunders, at the news that we can drive on the hard shoulder. The nearest motorway is over an hour's drive from here, so it'll hardly change our... I take a wider view. We'll now have on three-lane motorways an additional lane for people in the middle lane to ignore. The whole thing is a logical progression from cycling on the pavements. Next year, we can drive our cars on the pavements as well. In rural Suffolk, the pavements are the safe place to drive, given the potholes, American servicemen, and small blonde women in massive off-roaders. <laughs> Why is it always small blonde women in massive off-roaders? <laughs> and listen, just in case you think I'd be ignoring it, Craig White says, as a corner shakes pat living near Aylesbury. Oh. That's not easy. I'd like to wish you all a happy St. Pyron's Day. St. Pyron, as any Egypt knows, is the patron saint of Cornwall. Oh, and legend has it he upset the Irish and they threw him off a cliff, attaching him to a millstone, and he floated to Cornwall. Each year the Cornish will try and reciprocate. We'll be celebrating the day in traditional style, by eating a pasty, singing Trelawney, Telling my children how to pacify a knocker, driving a tractor slowly down both lanes of the bypass, and threatening to burn down my neighbour's house. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. Off to what could be described as a lively start. A good morning to you. I didn't have my troubles to seek getting in here this morning. How can you? How can engineering work overrun on probably the busiest commuter road in Europe? How does that happen? 
I'm just watching Breakfast News. Anyone else see the whaling article? There's been a whaling article on Breakfast News with a correspondent named Jonah Fisher. How can I take that seriously? Nick from Winchester. Yes, I think it's probably art imitating life or, or vice versa. I noticed a disturbing headline in my paper yesterday, says Ewan, Ewan Ooze Army. Um, Jury's still out on 24-hour drinking. Does this explain why it takes days to reach a verdict? I don't know. And with reference to the government's assessment of the success of the 24-hour drinking laws, and I quote, says Roger... Uh, Mr. Me Senseless, there appears to have been a reduction in violent crime since the change in licensing laws. Oh, could that be that's because no one can stand up long enough to start a fight? Pass the corkscrew. I don't mind if I do. Although Master Chef is over, and what a shame. I, I miss the boys, don't you? John and Greg, eh? Hey? Cooking doesn't get any... Oh, right. The Master Chef is over. I fear the series has left its mark on me. Says Malcolm, Malcolm Powder. I, I offered to do some breakfast for my 11-year-old son, and he opted for his firm favourite, scrambled eggs, baked beans and toast. The meal was successfully cooked, timed to perfection. I was ready to plate up. Oh, you had a plate of food there, Malcolm Edger. The lightly brown toast was cut into small triangles and stacked, forming a 3D star shape. The scrambled eggs were rolled around the internal faces of two spoons and placed strategically. The baked beans formed a perfect circle. I even removed a stray blob of juice with the corner of my white tea towel. The whole dish was a triumph. I placed it in front of my boy at the table, and he took the first mouthful in, in true Master Chef style using a small garden fork. <laughs> <laughs> he looked up. He looked at me and remarked, "Eggs, soft, creamy, and just the right amount of seasoning. Then the firm beaniness of the beans shoots through and mixes with the crispy crunch of the supermarket bread toast. I like it. I like it a lot." My face lit up after receiving such praise. However, he added, "Can you pass me the tomato ketchup?" Unsurprisingly. I could not hold back the tears, realising I'd let myself down and feeling so deeply upset at his comment that surely my only option was to go and throw myself under a bus. However, I snapped out of it in time to give him a resounding clip round the ear and he's having cornflakes tomorrow. Joe is working with us this morning and this apparently, this may well be from her own, her own life, I don't know, um, just gave me this. My husband, being unhappy with my mood swings bought me a mood ring the other day so he'd be able to monitor my moods. We've discovered that when I'm in a good mood, it turns green, and when I'm a mad, in a bad mood, it leaves a big red mark on his forehead. Maybe next time he'll buy me a diamond. <laughs> and uh, Artie, uh, Mr. Faherty, says, somewhere in the southeast, I'm writing to inquire what's become of one of your former correspondents, an old actor called Wilton Shagbile. Did he expire mid-soliloquy? I ask because one of our King's College uh, colleagues, an ex-thespian, was nicknamed Wilters after him. Could have been nicknamed worse. And now some lovey upstart called Duffer Chandridge seems to have replaced him. So henceforth our colleague will be known as Duffers. And, and rightly so. This morning's comment, which was yesterday, of course. Well, yesterday is... Uh, tomorrow was new yesterday, if you remember. Um, this morning's comment about Terry the Tog Whisperer. Well, there's dog whisperers and cat whisperers and horse whisperers and, and I'm a dog whisperer. Is most apt in that Terry, Caesar Millen and George Clooney all have striking resemblances to one another, although Caesar is a little challenged in the height department. Well, you can't be very tall if you're going to whisper to dogs. I did happen to say earlier on, I don't mind if I do. and said it's an old catchphrase from way back when, from the last unpleasantness and wondered if any of the old togs would remember stuff like that. Got a Colonel Chinstrap in Itma, wasn't it? And Pat Stimson does, although she's far too young. Her granny must have told her about it. Can I do you now, sir? After you, Claude. After you, Cecil. I feel as fresh as a daisy, a dead one. Is it fun for speaking? It's being so cheerful that keeps me going. Ah, <laughs> Pat. Memories, memories. Was in Itma, was it Itma had uh, railing the Chinese fence. I'm glad there isn't going to be a referendum, says Barnsley Chop. Well, 
If there had been, I'd have had to learn what the Lisbon Treaty is all about. And to be honest, I've better things to do than trawl through the lies, the counter-lies, and the statistics. At my time of life, I'm much happier, stuffing my arm down the back of the sofa, looking for loose change. I don't care if David Beckham wears one. Neither do I. Some of those frightening ads for underwear. Where's one? Men wearing cardigans, especially beige, are the male equivalent of women wearing pinnies or hairnets. And what is wrong with the odd hairnet or roller? Hmm? Paulie Lynch of Bradwell. You're turning into a right old commodion. Ah, and Happy O'Reilly is writing, probably from O'Connell Street. Faith and Begob. You see, he must be Irish. I read in the paper today, and indeed I heard Sarah Kennedy refer to it and her... Uh, when she zips through uh, the showbiz news. In bygone days, the film censors in the old sod, oh yes, in Ireland we had our film censors, had the scissors out to chop such classics as Expresso Bongo, King Kroll, King Creole, and Saints Preservers, The Quiet Man. <laughs> how, could they, how could they have found anything to cut in The Quiet Man? I don't know. Hey, you're at the King's outings in particular came in for particular attention. This is Elvis. His abdominal dancing was thought to be too suggestive. Another casualty was the Peter Pan of pop, Sir Cliff, whose sauna scenes were deemed too explicit. Ah, uh, well, he can be explicit in a sauna. Fair enough, ski. Wish ya. You see, again, this must be Irish. Wish ya. Sure, it's clear to me now that nothing but a life of fastidiousness and clean thought as a lad because of this. And then... I turned to the old gin in the end. I know, I said, it's a mother's ruin. Yeah, I know you're not a mother, but it could have ruined you if you were. Well, as we togs and your underlings know, there can be mornings when you're just a teeny bit curmudgeonly. What? Me? Never. However, uh, the good news is, according to one report this morning, you can't help it. Yeah, it's never, it's never your own fault for anything these days anyway. It's usually your parents. Research has shown that 50% of your natural disposition, is down to genetics. You're either born happy or grumpy. You can improve your happiness by writing down three things to be grateful for every day and making a list of all your strengths. <laughs> Won't take long. Last week, ah, uh, Alan of Sibford Gower. I knew his father, Sibford Gower. He used to play cricket. Last week, while on a short walking holiday in sunny Mallorca, I decided to introduce some hill stumbling into the activities. Ah, I'm now sitting at home with my broken right leg in plaster and getting around on crutches. Aren't you the great man now? Hmm? Should your other listener ever have a similar problem, I recommend the new sport of office chair skiing. Great way to get around the kitchen. Once you're seated in the office chair, you use the crutches as ski poles to whiz about. I'm getting so proficient, I'm thinking of jetting off to the Alps next week to complete in the giant slalom. Being at home with my feet up has given me much more time to watch the television. There's nothing on it, Alan. It's become very obvious that all the big brands have a tagline to help sell their products. With this in mind, I'd like to run this up the flagpole and see your salutes. Wogan. Because you're witless. Not bad. Uh, and by the way, should you ever meet the lady who goes, Mmm, Danone, will you give her a good slap for me? I must go now. My wife Jan is waiting to wash my feet and treat my athlete's foot. Lucky girl. <laughs> yes, indeed. Incidentally, I was watching, uh, because of, you know, I don't have a proper job, uh, in the afternoon, around about five o'clock, I was watching... Um, Jasper Carrot, great fella, and Golden Balls. Does anybody understand what that is? Can you follow it? Do you know what's going on? I don't care. See if I care. The inhabitants of Tarsi in Oxfordshire have, have turned up in numbers. <laughs> Huge people. It's a land of giants there, I think. The smallest person is, of course, Ken Bruce. And just listening to all the problems on the M4 and the M40 while having a nice evening glass of wine in Kayakura, North New Zealand. It's 9.35 Thursday evening here. I can see into the future. Don't worry, all the jams are gone. You'll get home safe. The best place to listen to traffic problems is in New Zealand. Is it indeed, Ian Setchell? Hmm. <laughs> Well, as a senior member of the Cardigan Club, I must complain about the frivolous and insulting remark being hurled at our garment of choice, says Ralphie. Mine has been honed and stretched into a very eccentric shape, and the colour is no longer recognisable. Charlie, being one of the new boys, Charlie Nove, 
he's our King of the Cardi, will soon get his fit comfortably. And may I remind you that Roger Moore started his career modelling cardigans? He didn't do badly, did he? So remember our motto. Don't be tardy. Respect the Cardi. Fair play, do you tell? Welsh dragon here. I knew it might... I, I knew it had come from Wales. Of course, half of Wales is over in Dublin at the moment. Fair play to you, you tried. But didn't they warn you that it would be hard going trying to cheer up the depressed Walford crew? You were doing okay. Hunting Shirley threw the cushion at you and knocked you off the table. <laughs> Look, uh, Carrie, Carrier Bag says, um, I just wanted to let you know that I don't need any vodka to throw things at the radio when you're on. Oh, now, at last, your guilty secret's out. That you've another listener, there's no longer doubt, but I fear your head should hang in shame, for it's Bradley, he of Walford fame. There's even worse news. Don't get surly. You don't appeal to that bit of rough Shirley, who put a swift end to your blarney pushing by wrecking her tranny with a well-aimed cushion. I saw that. I saw that. And, um, I shall have a swift word. Well, as we know, uh, Jan of town, who keeps an eye on what's going on, which is... It's as well that somebody does. Uh, conquer fights are banned, of course, unless you're wearing armour. And eating homemade cakes are banned in some hospitals. <laughs> Not surprised. And sour flowers, yes. And about time to... However, according to one newspaper report this morning, an Italian restaurant in Portsmouth has gone one step further. Some people recently ordered, I'll, I'll have a Sambuca, please. Set it ablaze. Uh, to finish the meal, and indeed got one, but minus the flame. And they said... I, why, why haven't you... And she, the waitress said, I can't light it because of health and safety. <coughs> so, no candles on birthday cakes then for the future. And last, the other night, with nothing to watch on the old box, I stumbled across Torchwood. I've yet to stumble... I've stumbled across your man several times, particularly last Saturday night. And so there's not a lot of incentive to stumble across Torchwood. In the episode, one of the main actors was apparently <laughs> trying to become a tog. He was dead. <coughs> Sorry. Walking around as normal, talking rubbish, and generally making a nuisance of himself. Well, it's only part of the old tradition. And uh, Paul Carr Griffin of Aberdeen says, uh, Burada, I tell. Look, you're in Aberdeen, Paul Carr Griffin. This will not ingratiate you to the neighbours, or indeed the locals. In this new film, The Other Bowling Girl, can you tell me if it's crown green bowling, flat green bowling, or could it be ten pin? I can't find any information at all. I wouldn't want to turn up with the wrong clothes to take part. Do I need spikes or smooth soles in my shoes? You need nothing. It's got nothing to do with bowling. It's Berlin. Did you see EastEnders last night? Oh, don't, please, I've had enough. Half the mail is about it. Wendy read Red Robin. I hope not. You might have been a bit offended. Oh, well, we saw several households breakfasting in chaos, and guess what? They'd all the radio tuned to wake up to Wogan, which I thought was a bit of a surprise, to be honest, as I feel your program's much too sophisticated for them what live in the square. Now, I mean, anyway, any road up, they panned into old Shirley's gaff, and she was comatose, just for a second, laying lying on the sofa with, with the bo vodka bottle in the hand, and she had you on in the background. <laughs> she threw something at the radio and knocked you right off your feet. Still, she didn't mean it, because she was drunk as a skunk. Now, that's true. I shall have a word with Phil. Don't worry. And uh, good morning, lad. As you know, Terry, over the years, whenever I spotted an opportunity for you to enhance your career and give you a change of scene of a morning, I've sent you a message suggesting you get in there and damned quick. Well, I spotted another of these rare opportunities. Oh, thank you, Michael McMuckle of Gale Force Villa, Dumfries, of oh, the wind doth blow. Watching a bit of Monty Dunn, yes... Yes, I've been watching a bit of Monty Dunn, and you think, how did he work that one? His time, he's in a garden in Shanghai. I thought it's about time the BBC gave you a similar open ticket to get out and about, and yes, exactly, widen the horizons. Right? So, and I'm copying this to the head of Radio 2. There is no head of Radio 2. Radio 2 is a headless chicken. Now, how about this? No. Not Beijing or Paris, nor even Rio, Rome or Madrid. Now, anyone can go there for the BBC. Well, anyone does except me. No, I can just see the schedules. Wake up, Wigan. It's Wogan. Or Wogan in Wakefield. Or even Wallasey welcomes Wogan. I'm sure you're already excited. Well, indeed, every prospect pleases. Uh, the prospects of living in a caravan while you do your road show four mornings a week from around the country. No more having to get up at three o'clock in the morning to drive miles and miles for early rehearsals, precise timings, script adjustments and polishing of the drivel. No, you can fall out of your little bunk bed at quarter past seven. 
Your roadies will have done all the work. All you need to do is ad lib. Well, I'm sorry, there's none of that here. And put the records on your portable gramophone. I commend this initiative to the governors and look forward to receiving a new sweatshirt for my efforts. Some hopes you have, Michael McMuckle. And we don't have governors anymore on the BBC. Oh, trustees. Wake up to Rogan. This was a podcast from BBC Radio 2. Don't forget you can also download free podcasts for Steve Wright, Russell Brand and Chris Evans. Get more information now at bbc.co.uk slash radio 2. And wake up to Wogan every weekday morning from 7.30. Online, on digital and on 88 to 91 FM. Get more information now at bbc.co.uk slash radio 2.